All right, for the second part of segment one, we are going to dive into Absolute Power's optional combat rules. Uh, just like the previous video, these rules are 100% completely optional for your Absolute Power game based on if you need a bit more nuance or a bit more specificity. There's no reason that you have to have these. Uh, absolute Power is built around the, the narrative concept of the game, so the TriStat system does a great job of giving you the target numbers you need, the dice you need to roll. Let's move on. But if you just want a little bit more, a little bit more nuance, a little more specificity, well, these optional rules will help you out. And I almost hit the wrong button. <laughs> I almost hit stop share. Uh, but in the meantime, of course, hey, you can donate to us via PayPal. And thank you to all the folks who do donate to us uh, via PayPal. I kind of consider them the silent supporters. So I appreciate that. So we don't shout you guys out much, but uh, thank you for your donations. Same with Ko-Fi. Ko-Fi got a couple people that uh, donate to us through Ko-Fi on occasion. So I appreciate that. And Streamlabs, if it works for you. Some people says it works wonderfully. Some people say it doesn't work at all. I don't know what the difference is or why. It's there. <laughs> all right, so I think I said page 206, if I remember correctly. Yes, optional combat rules. All right, so why do we want optional combat rules? Well, let's start with combat role modifiers. The GM may impose appropriate obstacles when the players make an attack roll. An attack action normally assumes characters are engaged in active combat. Dodging enemy attacks, making quick strikes, when the opportunity arises, moving about, etc. The GM should not apply penalties for this sort of normal combat-related activity. Okay, so if you're doing normal stuff, it's already baked into the game. Don't throw more numbers in there. Now, in circumstances where a character's aim or concentration seems likely impeded, such as shooting someone who the character cannot clearly see, so concealment, <laughs> <laughs> or attacking a foe while hanging upside down, nut job. Uh, the GM <laughs> may, may assign obstacles to attack uh, to the attack roll. Likewise, in a stress-free situation, such as murdering an immobile victim or a target range shooting with nothing riding on uh, the outcome, the GM can, can apply an edge roll or assume an automatic success, which is what I would probably do, or perhaps even automatically allow a critical success. So there you go. So the point of this is you're doing something way out of the ordinary, and at this point, it's time to say, wait, 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 wait. you're not going to get your normal roll for doing this. Yeah, I mean, so, you're you're hopping on one leg, you're you're holding a, a bucket of sand in one arm, and you're trying to shoot someone at fifteen hundred yards. It's not going to be a normal roll, man. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, this is not. The number of possible attack roll obstacles, including both standard rules and the optional rules presented in this chapter, are summarized on tables nine nine through nine twelve. Okay. Uh, what page is that on? The GM may adjust or ignore these modifiers if it prefers as best fits the dramatic narrative. So it's a framework, and. Yeah. I know that there are some folks out there. I've actually heard the comments about it. There are some people gave me comments about this game. Like, I can't stand any game that can't stand true to its own rules. This game is a, st a story, a narrative game. You know, some people, that's those are poo-poo words, but uh, that's what it is. And I, even as somebody who might be a little bit more into the rules than, than a strict story game, I like frameworks over encyclopedias. So, yes, I'm going to use the chart that's given, but if I feel that the, the situation deems me to change it, and Heathen Dog's been in my games, I've done this quite a bit in Earthdawn. There are rules, therefore, uh, sometimes I'll change things up because it just fits what is going on. You have the right to do that. I shouldn't have to tell you that, but apparently I do. <laughs> All right, now, combat maneuvers. We talked a while ago about potentially readying or holding your action. Well, now we get to actually read about it. The ready maneuver lets an attacker take an action later in the round, after the character's initiative is over, but before the start of the next one. On the character's initiative, the player specifies the action the character will take and the conditions under which the character will take it. So, what do you want to do, and when are you going to do it? Any time before the character's next initiative, you may then take the readied action in response to that condition. Easy way is combat. If somebody comes around the corner, I'm shooting. Okay. If no one comes around the corner, you didn't use your action. It's gone. But Correct. if someone does come around the corner, the moment they do, you're going you're gonna to pop their head like a little blood balloon. 
Yeah. Fine. Now, effectively, that's an Overwatch position like that. So I don't know if the Overwatch is in the game, but you know, you could declare like an Overwatch uh, ready to action in that case. Yeah. The character's ready to action occurs just before the action that triggers it. Wait, what? Okay, I get what he's saying here. I'm not going to quibble over it, but it seems funny that I... Okay, I shoot before he comes around the corner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, effect precedes cause in this case. Yeah, yeah right. I, but I get the point of it. It's, yeah, to, yeah. it's to imply that, hey, you go first, all right? If the triggered action is part of an opponent's activities, for example, an attacker movement, the character interrupts the opponent's action because it takes place beforehand. So... Heathen Dog says he wants to get from here to here. There's a wall in the way. I say I'm aiming down the, the line of the wall, and if anybody comes across, I shoot. Before Heathen Dog gets to that point, I shoot. Yes. That, the, that's the, moment, the point of that. Yeah, the moment it is possible to shoot me performing the action that, that, that he said he was going to shoot because that's when it happens. I can do nothing else. I cannot respond to that action. That's what it seems like. Now, what about dodging? What about, you know, using Captain America shield? I don't know. Maybe we'll finish it and maybe the a, a defensive action, like a, a reflex action can be performed. We'll find we'll out, find maybe. Out. Uh, the character interrupts the opponent's action that takes place before it. If still capable of doing so, the opponent continues on his own action once the character completes the ready to action. So if you really wanted to get to that spot after you were shot, you can still go there, but you're going to get shot. Yeah. Or at least the attempt of a shot. If the character comes to his next action and has not yet performed the readied action, the readied action is lost, as Heathen Dog said earlier. So you can ready the same action again, of course. Uh, if the character takes a readied action in the next round before the regular initiative, the character's initiative count rises to that new point in the order of battle and does not get an additional regular action that round. That is your action. Yeah. So, hey, good news for you. Your initiative becomes earlier because you're you're holding your action you're waiting for this outcome to happen but you don't get to go then and when you rolled your initiative that is your action for the round all right initiative consequences of reading uh the holding character's initiative result changes after the ready to action since each character's initiative is determined only once at the beginning of combat for the rest of the encounter the initiative result is the count on which the character took the ready to action the character would therefore act immediately ahead of his opponent should that action have triggered the character's ready to action. Oh, okay. okay, I get it. I get it. So for for example, let, let's let's just say initiatives of one one through ten. Mm -hmm. You got you got a seven. And uh you the whole ready, I'm I'm ready to shoot someone who jumps over that wall. No one jumps over that wall until a until a three. But then boom, someone jumps over the wall and you shoot them. Mm -hmm. Your new initiative is what either two or three? Yes, yeah, for the rest of for the rest of combat. So it literally combat. changes your initiative. Okay, okay. All right. All right. I get it. I get it. So and I put this on the screen so you could see the last pair or so folks out there could see the last paragraph that uh, confirms that. All right. Now called shots. An attacking character may elect to suf uh, suffer obstacle. Suffer obstacles. Oh, that's right. Obstacles game term here. Maybe capitalized game terms? I don't know. And anyway, an attacking character may elect to suffer obstacles to an attack roll when attempting to hit a target in exchange for a called shot that provides some special advantage. For example, a called shot may reduce or bypass armor by attacking a small unarmored spot or strike a vital point inflicting increased damage. These penalties can be reduced with the precise aim combat technique attribute. Players must specify the chosen called shot before rolling the attack die. Okay. This is interesting. This is done a little differently than a lot of games, but I think I like it. Because it's not saying, oh, I'm just trying to shoot the head for, for, you know, obviously you're trying to shoot for extra damage, but it's not necessarily a called shot to the head. It's a called shot for an effect, which would mean, you know, using, you know, like the old champions example, it's all range killing attack just because yours is fire and mine's a bullet. It's still a range killing attack. In this case, you're still going for extra damage just because you're calling it a headshot. Yeah, you, you could do the same thing with a with a nut shot. Yeah, same thing. You're gonna get extra damage. Plus, uh, I, I I think you'd lose some sanity. <laughs> well, if you're playing <laughs> if you're playing with the sanity rules, okay. Yeah. Uh, called shot to disarm. A character may attempt to shoot or knock a weapon 
or object out of another person's hand instead of inflicting damage. If using a ranged attack, the roll suffers a major obstacle. Okay. If using a melee weapon or unarmed attack, the roll suffers a minor obstacle. If the attack hits, the target must make an average, target number 12, body stat roll to retain control of the weapon. If the stat roll fails, the character successfully knocks away the weapon. So basically, don't do this on superheroes. because <laughs> They're probably going to win that roll. Yeah, right? Uh, if the stat roll succeeds, the defender will suffer a major obstacle on the next action with that weapon since it's off balance. Oh, but so okay, so that oh, so okay. no matter even what, they still okay, okay, yeah. Even if they still have it, they're you know they're just screwed to use it the next round because it's all you know. I like that. I like that rule. Yeah, I think fine. it may, it makes sense. So like, even if you hold on to it, you're at a negative. Yeah, I mean, uh, if if you if uh, for for example, someone is going to shoot the hostage, point points a gun at hostage head. You shoot the gun. He retains control of the gun, but the moment he tries to shoot the hostage that round. He's going to have a major obstacle on his hands and he may miss. So even if you don't succeed, you still might succeed. So no matter what, what I like about it, and this is a very mechanical way of looking at it, but but it's my explanation for it. What I like about it is you already made the roll to hit. You shouldn't be punished because you made the roll to hit because he held on to it. Sure, you didn't get the full effect that you wanted, but you know what? You got a little bit of effect, and hopefully that was enough to, to turn the tide. All right. Called shot to reduce armor. We're not going to read all these. Called shot to vital spot. Called shot to weak point. Called shot to specific location. Called shot to knock out. So all those different types of uh, different attacks you can make in the, with optional combat rules. All right. Striking to wound. A character in combat can elect to reduce the delivered damage. So this is a Palladium's pull punch. Mm-hmm. Uh, to a minimum of one damage, known as striking to wound. Can I usually attempt this maneuver with weapons possessing the area? Auto fire. <laughs> I was just trying to wound, man. Yeah. Or <laughs> spreading enhancements. Uh, that makes sense. You know, you can't take your grenade and go like, I was just trying to grenade him to wound. Yeah, I didn't want to kill him. I, I just wanted to, you know, cut him up a little bit. <laughs> so, total attack. Ooh, this seems. Is, do you think this is Earthon's aggressive attack? I hope so. Let's see. All right. It's got a, a maneuver in it. It's got a maneuver in it. All right. A character can take this maneuver in conjunction with one single attack. He focuses completely on an offensive action with no thought given to defense. Yep. It's uh, it's aggressive attack. Yep. Uh, the character suffers a major obstacle on all defense rolls made until his next turn to act the next round. Wow. I, I mean, honestly, the rule systems are different, but it seems like it works just like aggressive attack, uh, but also gains a major edge on the attack roll. Aggressive attack. I did that. Did that give you a uh, a bonus to hit, or was it just a damage? I forget. It was a bonus to hit, and you took strain. No, no, no. You, no you're right. It was a bonus to hit and to damage. You took oh. strain, but you were also easier to hit. You're also yeah minus two to your to your uh, your physical you defense. Yeah, your physical defense. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's been a while since we've done it. So, and you're like, why are you talking about some other game in here? Because it's interesting. That's why. Uh, if the character has the extra actions attribute, all other attack actions are unmodified. So it only it only hurts your next. Wait, what? what? The character's have a major yeah, obstacle. All defense roll gives you a bonus on your next attack, not every attack that round. Okay, and yeah, so this is referencing still, the first. Okay. You still have the detriment for the entire round, even if you have extra actions, because it said specifically all defense rolls made until their turn to act again next round. Yeah. Yep. So okay. even having extra actions doesn't, doesn't mitigate the downside for total attack. Right. Um, it's major obstacle, but I'm trying to, okay. So it's just the only thing you get is a major edge. Well, I shouldn't say well, only it, thing. That's, a, that's pretty good. It's 2d6. I know, but okay. Well, all right. Attacks with two weapons, a character with a one-handed melee or ranged weapon in each hand, so you can go double pistol or double daggers, however you want to do it. Uh, against the same target or two different targets on his initiative, but with penalties to both rolls, minor obstacles when attacking the same target, or major obstacles when attacking different targets. Okay. If the character has the extra actions attribute, can only use this maneuver with one attack each round and not additional attacks. 
And the, the point of this rule is he can't cheese ball the game just by making two attack sets. Right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to have, I'm going to have, you know, major disadvantages with every attack, but I got 18 attacks. So right. one of them is going to hit. Actually, probably more than one, but yeah. But these attack roll penalties can be reduced with the two weapon combat technique. So if you're specifically trained to do it, basically you spend points to be able to use two weapons at one time. Boom. And that makes perfect sense. Yeah, it'll probably uh, go from major to minor obstacle. So we're going to move on here. Attacking moving targets, attack penalties in motion, firing from moving vehicles. Yeah, you're probably like, oh my God, this is a read through. You're supposed to be reading all these. These are optional rules. We're expressing some of the major ones to you, but uh, we are going to move on. Firing weapons from a mount. This one's actually one, actually uh, moving vehicles. This one's always interesting to me. I like to see how games handle this. Characters who are passengers inside a fast moving vehicle. So I'm driving, heathen dog shooting. Yep. Uh, fast moving vehicle fire their personal ranged weapons at targets outside the vehicle with a minor obstacle applied to the attack roll. So. Heathen Nugs, for whatever reason, sitting in the window frame out, out, outside the truck, and he's trying to shoot the car behind us that, you know, is, is chasing us, and yeah. Heathen Nugs going to die. I mean, that's just what happens in the real world if you try to do that. But you know what? These are This is a superhero movie cinematic narrative. Exactly. So it yeah. works. Right. <laughs> uh, this penalty increases to a major obstacle if the character is also piloting or driving the vehicle while firing. So if I'm just shooting over my shoulder, by <laughs> the way, obstacle. I get that one. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Just want to say this, and this isn't to be hyper pedantic. I'm saying this even though Don't it is fire real. a gun inside a car. Don't do that. It's good. You're going to have a bad time. You're gonna, your ears are not going to like you. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're not going to work for several minutes. There could be some blood. It's not going to be fun. <laughs> When when heathen dogs start screaming at me to take a left turn, all I'm gonna hear is. <laughs> um, all right, but obviously this is a game, so uh, these penalties can be reduced to the steady hand combat technique attribute. Characters firing the vehicle's built-in weapons do not usually suffer this penalty because it's part of the vehicle; it's not being tossed around like you are. So the penalties outlined above for attacking fast-moving targets or while moving rapidly may apply. Sure. All right, many modern or high-tech mecha, tanks, super cycles, etc. could have stabilization mechanisms that negate this character attack penalty. This yeah. technology can be represented by the vehicle possessing the steady hand combat technique instead. And that'll be when we cover vehicles and items and so forth. So Yeah, that's like uh, put, putting a power into your vehicle, and this one would be computer-assisted targeting. Yeah. There you go. Or, or, or also could be, uh, uh, was it, uh, gravitational dampeners. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Uh, combined attacks. Oh yeah, that's two people punching at the same time. Bam. Uh, do you want me to read it? No, nah, it's fine because that's what it is. So let's let's move on. We we know what that range is. penalties. So it talks yeah. about uh, Low adding range, intermediate penalty. range, effective range. But here okay. you go. And this chart tells you everything that you need to know about it. So if you have rank three, defective range is up to twenty meters, but you can do a med an intermediate range, which is a minor obstacle. Or you could go all the way up to 100 meters with a major obstacle. If you remember, what, if you don't remember what major obstacle is, you add two dice to your roll. So you're rolling 46, but you have to pick the two lowest. Yep. Now, if you roll four sixes, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> all right. Uh, critical hits. Ooh, yeah, I want to see critical hits. Ooh, and critical failures. Oh, we can have fumbles. Well, That's both, awesome. Both are good. Both are good. Yep. Now, normally critical hits and fumbles don't come with the game, but this is something right. you can add in. And let's be honest, do you know a game master who doesn't use Oh, fumbles? everyone loves critical <laughs> hits, especially, and every game master loves critical failures. Everyone. I love them. I love them. Everyone loves them. In some instances, the attacker's strike is so powerful or overwhelming that it delivers damage greater than its normal maximum amount. No one has a critical hit. If the attacker's total roll is significantly higher than the defender's total roll, a critical hit is scored. Okay, so we have to see table 8-2, page 169. What means, yeah. 210. So, um... Do, 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 do. Is that it? Oh, post oh, here, oh, it's this margin of success thing that we were seeing before. Yeah. Hey, now we got actually a use for it. Still doesn't tell me what a monstrous success is. Oh, maybe it will in the next chapter. Maybe it will. Uh, was it 210? Is that what I said? Yep. Yep. If the attacker's rolls exceeds the defender's roll by at least 12, 
a major margin of success. The final damage delivered is doubled. Holy crap. It just jumps up to doubling, man. Yeah. You might be saying, well, a lot of games do that. Have you seen yeah, the amount of damage this game? The amount pop? of damage here is crazy. I mean, you, you could easily put two or three points into something and do 100 damage. Yes. I mean, come on. This is, this is getting weird now. The final damage delivered is doubled. Okay. If the attacker's roll exceeds the defender's roll by at least 18, the final damage is tripled. Now, there is a very, very particular word here. The final damage is tripled. So that means you do all the calculations first. That means armor versus versus attack. Yeah. Then you trip. That's actually not so bad. That's really? not so bad. I don't know, because uh, you also have damage multipliers built into the game. So it's after the damage multipliers. So I don't know, man. It could get sure, but, but your, ar your armor is multiplied as well. Mm. Those numbers generally cancel. Like one to one, they generally cancel each other out. Yeah. So, yeah, to be fair, if you are more powerful, so if Heathen Dog's more powerful than me in this regard, yeah, it's going to be a bad day for me. But if I do, if he's more powerful than me and, and I get the triple, it could be dangerous. It definitely has a higher chance. But, I mean, if his armor absorbs everything, you know what three times zero is? Yeah. So, also, you know, so anyway, the defender's armor rating reduces the inflicted damage. Okay, stop. Oh, after stop the multiplying. Oh, now it's broken. Now it's broken. <laughs> yeah, yep. After the multiplying effect of a critical hit. That means I'm doing 300 damage. Your puny 20 armor means you're uh, less of a of a charred, of a charred piece of mess. You're still going to have your defense in there. So sure. hopefully you've got a high defense. Hopefully. So there we go. Additionally, the health points lost due to a called shot to vitals are doubled after the critical hit multiplying effect. You oh can do God. six times the damage with a called shot. Oh my God. This No, no. This is way too deadly. This see, our, Yeah, but first look what you, this but you have to deadly. get 18 higher than your target number, though. It's not easy that's to true, do. true, but you know, that, that's, it's more like an instant win roll. Like, okay, he's dead. Well, I, I literally have that in my game. If you roll 3d6... So if you roll 666 on 3d6, it's a kill shot. Okay. Uh, now, there are exceptions to that rule, like armor, but the, the idea is, yeah, you got the maximum. Uh, the 3d6, because what's the percentage chance of getting 666? Uh, it's like point whatever percent. I forget what it is. Anyway, it's, it's less than a, it's less than a one on a d20, and it's even less than one on a, one, on a percentile die. So I was like, that can be a kill shot. So I, so I get it. Now, why do I say that? Because, again, you have to defeat the roll by 18 to get that triple. And, you, and you're taking an obstacle because you're making a called shot. That's true. That is true. Okay. So you already exceed the, your yeah, target you already by a lot a miracle yeah. just in making the role so i i, I guess they the, the the book wants to reward your miracle with you just win or you're just that much better than your target and you shouldn't be impressed because you should have done that you know <laughs> there's two ways of looking at it. all right uh unopposed critical hits we're not gonna do that ignore size modifiers really range attack and defense modifiers for size templates are ignored when determining whether attack is critical hit or not oh wow that is the required margin of success 12 plus or 18 plus must be achieved without considering the range attack or defense attributes or inept attack and defense defects. So interesting. If the character has a defect that makes him easier to punch or I'm sorry, shoot does not matter. You have to do it based off of, off of a natural role that makes it even harder. Mm -hmm. Well, just for this one character, but you get what I'm saying. Like, so these aren't Insta, Insta successes. Right. So, yeah, I'd have to see it in action before I decide, you know, whether I completely agree with it or not. But generally speaking, I'm, I've, I've, you know, doing my best some time. Eh, I didn't see 100 points of damage actually thrown out there. So we talk about it because it's possible, but, you know, so I, I, I probably works. Anyway, uh, alternative critical natural 12. So if you roll 2d6, that is a 3% chance, if I remember. That could be. That could be excessive with these numbers, but you know your mileage may vary. All Let's right, see critical failures the other side. That's what I want to see. If you're playing the rules for critical hit in your game, you may also want to consider framework for critical failures. After all, some superpowered attacks attempts are so wildly ineffective that they actually cause harm to the aggressor. Okay, if the attack if the attacker's roll is substantially lower than the defender's total roll, the result is a critical failure. 
also known as fumble. If the attacker's role is lower than the defender's role by at least 12, because remember, you're doing this offense-defense thing, mm -hmm. the GM applies one of the consequences and tables 9-3 critical failures. All right. Okay, go ahead and give me a, a 2d6 roll. Okay. And while I'm doing this, thank you, Full Metal Dragon, for the YouTube membership. Appreciate it. You said 3d6? A 2d6. 3d6, okay. Six. All right, six. Character stumbles and twists his ankle, cutting off his cutting his movement speed in half until he rests for several hours or otherwise healed. Okay, that's not so bad. I mean, you know, unless you're trying to get away, then that's bad. <laughs> you're doing the Peter Griffin thing. <laughs> <sighs> <sighs> What else we got? Character hits a nearby solid surface and damages or breaks their weapon. Attacker is off balance and suffers a major obstacle on all defense rolls until initiative next round. Character overexerts themselves and pulls a muscle, suffering minor obstacle to all body stat rolls during the next 24 hours. If you pull okay, a back, yeah. if you've pulled a back Superman muscle, you pulled a muscle. Nah. Well, if if you've pulled a back muscle, you know that uh <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's actually... true yeah but i'm a normal guy you know yeah. i'm just a dude well maybe superman can't do that but uh then again superman isn't gonna fumble so let's just be honest superman isn't yeah, gonna superman fumble doesn't fumble you're right yeah but he's so much better than everyone else he's rolling so many dice i mean just just being kryptonian on earth gives you a minor a minor advantage on everything all right, grappling is something I, I kind of want to skip it, but now that I think about it, grappling is something that everybody complains about in every game ever. So let's see how we're going to complain about it in this one. <laughs> uh, grappling attack must have at least one empty hand free. Grabbing a small inanimate object that is not the individual sphere of control does not usually require an action. Okay, resolve a grappling attempt like a normal unarmed attack. The combatant with a greater number of free hands or manipulating appendages gains an advantage a minor edge to the attack or defense role yeah you thought that prehensile tail was stupid ha <laughs> there Not you go day. or uh, hey the fentari from battle lords now the fentari has an advantage there Just, you go was it two tentacles per arm if i remember correctly yep. Yep. um all right successful grappling attack inflicts no damage but the attacker can hold a grab character relatively stationary the target suffers minor ob minor obstacles on all attack and defense rolls when performing other melee attacks or defenses or major obstacles when attempting to perform other tasks requiring freedom of movement such as using handheld equipment mm. my issue with this and I'm not trying to be hyper pedantic on this one. But in a world of superheroes or in a world where people are combat trained, like, you know, mixed martial arts, wrestling, whatever. I am of the mind that the uh, that when you successfully grapple somebody, they are so, done. Yes. That person's only maneuver is to break the grapple. Try and get out. Yeah. Try and break. I mean, if they can fly, I might allow them to fly you know, take you with them, but just go straight up, you know, or something like that. I, I might allow that, but anything else? No, you got to break out first. Yeah. I mean, is it, is it, uh, is it completely accurate? No. I mean, if you've got eye beams, you can't hold someone's arms, legs, and eyes, unless you've got a lot of hands, you know, so may maybe they, maybe they can do that or, you know, some other stuff. If, if, if they have a special power that, that they, that they ooze acid out of their skin, they could do that. Because it doesn't require movement or or aiming or anything. Okay, maybe that. But only a minor obstacle on all attack and defense rolls and a major obstacle when attempting to perform things that that require using hand a freedom of movement. So freedom of movement. What is that? I mean, being grappled means you do not have freedom of movement. I don't... Yeah, I'm having trouble with this one. Yeah, I'm doing some visualization where I can find times where in a narrative sense, you know, you say you grappled me, you pinned me to the ground, you've got me in some sort of arm bar, but I'm still holding on to the detonator where I could let, you know, where I could still do that. Yeah. Um, but those are very narrative type yeah. situations. Uh, generally speaking, I think... I think I just prefer the concept that if you're grappled, you can only try to free yourself, and then you make a narrative ruling on, well, 
okay, you are holding the detonator or yeah. um, you, like you said, the I beams or something, but that's yeah. just a, uh, or you, you have a, you have a hydra cyanide pill in your tooth, you know, <laughs> un- unless they're grappling your mouth open, then you can still do that. All right. And then you have maneuvers. You have uh once character grabs an opponent. Oh, so wait a second. So maybe it's grapple first, do something. Oh, oh hold on. Hold the phone. Well, and yeah, grapple this maneuver next as his next attack. So lock. Yeah. A character who on the previous attack successfully grabbed an opponent can choke, crush, or strangle that foe. This lock automatically hits and inflicts normal unarmed damage. Okay. I'm with that, but lock should mean block but um a standing character who has already grabbed an opponent can hurl the foe to the ground this is resolved as a normal unarmed attack successful hit releases the foe from the grapple but inflicts extra five damage plus any additional falling damage mm. I, I almost think the opposite on this one but okay um the attacker throws an opponent at another enemy <laughs> well it is a superhero game right yeah, yeah must make doing, a successful yeah. defense roll or suffer equal damage as well throw throw the jabronis against each other that's great Disarming via grappling, well, um, pin, biting, pinning, pinning. Char- that's what char- that's what I'd more likely do. A character who has grappled somebody, someone may attempt to improve the hold during the next attack by completely immobilizing the opponent and pin. Okay, there it is. So the way this game works is it's a it's it's a two parter. Yeah, you don't just grab grapple and win, and then immobilize in the next attack. Okay. okay. You know what? I'm going to backtrack and say I actually agree with this. Or, I, I mean, not like it's the perfect system ever, but here's why. Instead your of initial saying... grab is, is going to be fought off pretty well, yes. but your subsequent pin, the, the defender is at a disadvantage because you are you have a hold on their body. Yes. Okay, yeah, I, I get it. But, you know, that it seems overcomplicated for a superhero game like this. Well, that's why they are optional rules. That's why right? it's optional rules. Yeah, got it. So, okay. Uh, once a character pins an opponent, the target suffers a major obstacle on all rolls when attempting to escape. A pin character cannot attack or defend. And that's interesting because most games kind of make it like an equal roll. This one says, I'm thinking, the mindset is because we made it a two-step process instead of an a, I gotcha process, well now since it's it took you to this. Yeah. Yeah. It's even harder to get out once you're in a full okay. immobilize, which is a pin. Yeah, got it. Alright, okay. so if you want to bite, you want to try to escape ground fighting, do some ground and pound there. There we go. Optional defense rules. Hedging defense to set target number. That, what? <laughs> I, mean, I think I get it. Um, to speed up combat, gaming groups could consider always having player characters and NPCs hedge their defense rules. Oh, this is that, uh, was it selecting an automatic 7 or whatever it is? This option sets a clear target number for the attacker before the dice are rolled, which reduces the combat randomness by half. I, no, see, I'm the opposite. Combat is yeah. a scrum. Well, yeah, it should be should more. Be yeah. <laughs> it should, should be as random as possible. With to, that makes some sense. Yeah, in groups where players prefer making their own defense rules, this option may instead only be used when attacking NPCs. That I can kind of, especially for mooks. Like for mooks, and I think you talked about this last time. Yeah, yeah. If it's just the average, you know, foot soldier dude, you know, like like not every member of the foot clan deserves his own you know range of abilities right, right. i mean come on shredder yes but the rest yeah, shredder, yes you know common common foot soldier number seven no okay defending against multiple attacks uh they be overwhelmed defenders with the flanking defense combat technique suffer reduced penalties where's the penalty oh even the uh uh maxes out at major obstacles under defense rolls since too many flanking opponents get in each other's way so where, oh, did I miss the number? A minor roll on the second or third defense, a major obstacle on the fourth or any later defense. So if you have a bunch of people surrounding you, I usually go with the... the six. Yeah, six. That That's Maximum my yeah. unwritten rule uh, is, is six. And yeah, that's how many people After can hop After that, on. they get in the way and you, you, you can't harry someone over six people. Right. It doesn't work. And you can defend others defense in non-combat situations, defending with an offensive... That What's that? I'm going to jump in front of that bullet. Better you than me? Yep. Uh, using attributes defensively? Uh, no, I'm not going to read it. Okay. Oh, wait. If it's the last thing, I will. No, it's not the last thing. Attribute versus attribute? When two that characters means- put their attributes against each other, who wins? This would be... Okay, the one... Oh! 
Okay, interesting rule here. I thought it was going to be an opposed rule. When two characters pit their attributes against each other, who wins? In most situations, it's the character with the higher attribute level. Makes sense. Hmm. I mean, there's there's less randomness. If I'm just raw stronger than you are, in with without in a level playing field, I'm going to win every time. Yeah, but raw stronger. That would be a stat, not an attribute. That's why I'm like, hmm. But this oh, paragraph okay. here seems like it, it cures my my okay, let's see it then. ponder my pondering. If the two attributes are close in level, usually the same or differing by only one level, the GM may request an opposed stat roll to see who wins the con- contested action. Using the above example, if the alien's flight level is four instead of three, the GM could request an opposed body stat roll. The character with the higher total wins the contest. For these situations, if the attribute levels are close but not identical, the GM may award a slight, the slightly more powerful character with a minor edge on the opposed role. Yes, okay, okay. okay. You know what? If your attribute's crazy higher, you're just so much better yeah. at the ability yeah, than me to win. win. Here, here, here's an example I'm thinking of. Uh, two, two, uh, two superpower beings, one good guy, one bad guy. They both have energy expulsion. They, they both uh, shoot laser beams out of their eyes, right? And they both fire at each other at the same mm-hmm. time. And, the and they're hit, stuck in the middle. And they <laughs> stay in the middle. But but the but the villain has a rank five and the hero has a rank three. Mm-hmm. Villain wins. That little ball of Contessa energy goes right into the face of the hero. Now, if they're close or equal, then it's more of like a who poops pushing harder. And that person wins. OK, I get it. I get it. Yeah. And maybe the good guy isn't trying to win. He's just trying to stop it. So that's fine. As long as I can delay this I beam while something else is going on it's happening in the background. Yeah. 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 The, 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 all of the jabronis uh, are getting to safety or whatever, you know, all the, all the women get their strollers out of the way. Fine. Okay. And then it talks if you have some sort of synergy with like, you know, super strength and so on and so forth on there. And I'll let you read that. Um, I, no, generally speaking, I, I think that rule is, it makes sense. Yeah. It's also very dramatic. Yep. A dynamic initiative we're not gonna yeah i have to it's 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 a core part of the game <laughs> so initiative regulates the order in which characters act in each combat round it is checked only once at the beginning of the combat scene before any characters before any character has a chance to act and remains constant for the entire fight and everybody knows i don't like that system right in any game so uh, some game groups may prefer a more unpredictable and dynamic action order that varies more frequently though to accommodate this preference, initiative could instead be determined at the beginning of each combat round instead of just once each battle. Otherwise, all normal initiative rules, modifiers apply. Guess guess who is going to have this optional rule as a permanent house rule in the game? Back. So, um, yeah, I, I again for me, it's the whole scrum thing. That's that's why. But okay, you know. And to be fair, he doesn't have to put this in the book. This is just something that you as a game master can do, but I like the fact that he put it in here to let you know that every aspect of this game can be modded. Here, here's the framework to do it, and if if you come up with something that's not in the book, guess what? Do it. Sure. All right. What else we got? Um, these are opposing attribute types. Look at look at all that that long list. That so it says. Book. Uh, Air is strong against electric, dominant over density, weak against chemical, and dominated by natural forces. Now you'd be like, wait, what? Let's find something a little more uh, normal. Um, I thought that said meth. (laughs) Meth. Dominant (laughs) against most people. (laughs) Uh, That's okay. This is interesting. So time. Time is strong against natural forces yeah because time entropy increases yeah, it right breaks down everything yeah it's dominant over chaos sure it's weak against death because it ultimately ends up in that right and dominated by insect what i don't know maybe he just had to put something there oh okay yeah this anyway moving weird. on Moving on, yeah, we're not we're not going to delve into that little that little uh, crap pie. Spreading extra actions across initiative, you can look at that. I'm not going to read uh, read it, but here I zoomed in, hopefully enough to where you can see it. And if you want to pause it and look at it, go for it. And I think so. Oh, absolutes and absolute power. Yes, this is the last thing. All right, well, what are the absolutes and absolute power? Sure. Sometimes players want to design characters in absolute terms. 
in ways that Absolute Power was not designed to function as an effects-based system. Consider the following player request. I want my character's Razor Whip attack to cut through any armor, regardless of how tough it is. Well, pardon my language, I'm going to say a poo-poo word. Hide the kids for just a moment. But you can shit in one hand and want in the other one to see if one fills up faster. Yeah, Not everyone gets a lightsaber. Right? And if you're only a 75-point character... You don't have a lightsaber, especially one in whip form. My character's genetic mutation should be able to imitate any ability, no matter how powerful. These are all these are all like like wishes I laugh at. These are yeah. bad. Um, there is a power in the game that lets you do something similar to that, but you still have to spend points on it. You still yeah. have you know it can only replicate so much stuff. My character is so accurate with guns that he never misses his target. Well, I Again, hope you have... You know, hey, you, you want to be Neo? Go find yourself a Matrix. We're not here. <laughs> right actor, wrong shot, is John Wick. John Wick. Okay, fair enough. You want to be John Wick? Go go, go make a movie. <laughs> right? Yeah, um, it's just, it's funny. Now, here's the thing. You could put so many points into it that you could effectively never miss, yeah. depending on the power level of the campaign, but you've got to spend the points. And at some point, so, if the Game Master is doing something right... There's going to be something way more powerful than you that you guys have to use teamwork to fight against. So no. All right. My we, character's we, we force stop reading this. This is all this is all ridiculous nonsense. Well, there's only two more. I think they're funny. I th I think they're funny. My character's force field always stops all damage. Of course. Always sure. and all, right? Yep. Yep. And my alien powerhouse will always be the strongest character in the room, regardless of where he's from. These are all these are all bad players. Yes, thank you. I was waiting for that. Yeah. Was, um, all right. To accommodate these requests, the player can either assign attributes at incredibly high levels to effectively mimic absolutes, or can work with the Game Master to create unique attributes that function outside the normal scale. But Game Masters, the game, the game is already built around a system where you have the points, you do your thing. Those are just dumb requests. Yes, right. these are stupid. Um, I don't know why this is even in here. This shouldn't even be in here. Uh, you, you know can what? optionally ruin your game now. Here, look. It's in the rules. Well, no, he basically says spend the points. It's like, and, you know, if you want to create a unique attribute, well, a good game master should be like, no, use the attributes in the book. Yep. All right. So there we go. Those are, uh, those are the optional combat rules. Uh, next, we're going to talk about ex uh, expanded damage rules. We already touched on some of them. We got what? Shock and knockout, yep. serious injury, catastrophic damage. Uh, variable damage. Uh, we're not going to look at every chart here. We'll probably skip most of this, but we'll look at one or so of them. Uh, and pushing your powers. There you go. Oh, yeah, that's right. The new social combat system. What else? Sanity rolls. Again, we're not going to read this word for word. We pretty much went over what you need to know in this in the last video, but we will look at some of the stuff in here. NPC morale. For anybody who's played Dungeons & Dragons, the old, especially old Dungeons & Dragons, you know the morale checks. Uh, so there we go. Mass combat. And we're still in chapter nine. Character creation option. Yeah, the, a lot of this we're going to skip in terms of word for word, but we will look at it conceptually just to make sure we cover it. A lot of, lot of optional stuff in this book. Look at all this. And I think this is the end of it. Yeah, that's the end of it. So a lot more to go, but, you know, it'll get you an idea of what you can do with the game. What do you have for questions, comments, concerns out there? All right, let's see here. We got... Uh... I see a super chat. Yeah, we do. We got the uh, CPK. Ventari. Says, Ventari! <laughs> <laughs> uh, Darthy comes back with uh, Heathen Dog. If nothing else, if the GM's ideas on how to handle any grappling that occurs in the games, fair enough. It gives them ideas. Yeah, the, that's fine. And uh, Full Metal Dragon says that would be on the degree in which someone is grappled. And then he, you actually answer that with the pin. What, <laughs> we, we got the grapple and then we got the pin, which actually does what we thought the grapple should do in the beginning. And he was saying, hey, maybe it, this is, you know, this is only step one. And he was right. It was step one. Grapple is step one. Pin is step two. And then step three is profit. Yeah, I, I mean, to be 100% honest, I prefer something like Forbidden Lands, where it's like you make one roll and you're grappled, and your only thing is to break free or not, and then just use, if you have to, use a narrative effect to say, well, you got me grappled, but I can still do, you know, boom, you know, with the detonator, or 
you make a called shot with the grappling to say, I'm going to grapple that hand so he can't set off the detonator. Yeah. Then it's a called shot and you get that effect, you know, but that's my preference. I don't think right. the rules are bad or wrong. Just it's not my preference. Okay. And then uh, Lightseeker says he picked up these books after watching your earlier vids, looking forward to giving it a go. That's awesome. Love awesome. Um, yeah. And just remember, if you like this, there's also Ab uh, Bessem. And there's the Tristat Court. Oh, the book's way over there. There's the Tristat Court. It's a little tiny book, but it's make whatever game you want. <laughs> you know? That's it. So awesome. Well, thank you for the comments, folks. Uh, where's my subscribe? Uh, please like, subscribe, and share. I know I kind of already scrolled, scrolled through it, but just to reiterate, in the next video, we're going to talk about... Uh, what are we can talk about we're going to talk about oh yeah da damage enhancements so how can you make your game's combat a little more nuanced a little bit more i don't want to say realistic uh situational i i think you'll like what, uh, what it has to offer and we'll look over one more time real quickly we'll look over the sanity and the social combat and uh what was the other one i guess there's mass combat we'll be looking at mass combat that's something that comes up a lot so